Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased today to be speaking with Dr. Stephanie Turnello about her book titled How the Heartland Went Red, published by Princeton University Press quite recently, in fact. We're very lucky to have her. And this book grapples with kind of where we're at now in American politics, and most importantly, how we got here, right? Because if we look at the sweep of the last few decades, I mean, okay, maybe more than a few, but, you know, chunk of the 20th century, um, there's a whole bunch of places, for example, on a map that have shifted from one political party to the other, and a lot of ideas and uncertainty and confusion about kind of what's actually the mechanisms happening there This book, I think, does a really fascinating job of investigating what is actually going on and how that might help us understand where we're at now. So, Stephanie, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast to tell us about your book. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Miranda. I'm really excited to be here and have this conversation with you. Likewise. And I think one of the things we can do to make this exciting for our listeners, too, is, of course, make sure they have a bit of an introduction and foundation (laughs) to start with. So can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to write this book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I am currently an assistant professor of government at Harvard University. Um, I've been here about two years. Um, And my PhD is actually in sociology. Um, So a lot of the reasons that I went to graduate school were to study uh, American politics. Um, But I, I kind of approach the study of American politics from maybe a different angle from a lot of my colleagues and peers. Um, And personally, I think that's that's really fun sometimes. Um, But I wanted to write the book and really like I was just saying, this is this is kind of the reason I did go to graduate school. Um, I was interested, I think, in two things. Um, a lot of it had to do with kind of how I grew up and where I grew up. And I think a lot of researchers feel similarly about their projects, which is that, you know, you have life experiences that don't seem fully reflected in the literature that you're reading early on in graduate school. And you kind of think, there's something missing here and you design a research project that could get at what's missing. And the things that seemed to be missing for me um, were an understanding of sort of heterogeneity in um, white working class politics, white working and middle class politics, um, heterogeneity that I've heard all the time from friends and family growing up that I felt like wasn't really well understood. And I felt like, despite the fact that um, particularly as sociologists, we spent so much time thinking about class, I felt like we still hadn't really nailed down how it was shaping American politics. Um, And so I was really interested in that. And then I was also really interested in kind of understanding smaller communities and heterogeneity in smaller communities. I was um, uh, really... um, learning a lot about sort of the urban sociological literature when I was early on in graduate school and had some great advisors who are urban sociologists. And I felt like a lot of the things that the phenomena we study uh, in neighborhoods actually often applies to small towns and small cities. Um, And I'm not the first person to have that thought. Um, Others, Japonica Brown Saraceno, for example, has written an entire book making that argument. But those were sort of the two things that I was interested in, this kind of you know, variation in white working class politics and then um, small, small cities, small towns. What's going on there? (laughs) Well, those sound like some very interesting starting points to kind of investigate from. And of course, you've then developed and thought through them further. Can you take us to and through the kind of puzzles and questions at the heart of the book and how you went from those two interests to these precise pieces? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a lot of time, in American politics, when we think about class politics, a sort of implicit reference point is the New Deal era. Um, And during that time, we had kind of the closest we ever had to um, what some scholars have called like a traditional class politics, where working in middle classes are more associated with the left and, you know, upper middle class folks, middle class folks more with the right. Um, And so when we talk about kind of what's happened to class politics, where is it today, we're thinking about what has changed since that kind of 
you know, high point of class politics in the U.S. And so that's where I started. I wanted to understand kind of um, the contemporary political ramifications of the breakdown of the New Deal coalition, particularly for white voters and white working class voters who'd been sort of so central to the rise of the New Deal coalition. So I started with that and um, I identified all the counties that could be considered part of the white working class New Deal coalition. Um, And then because I was interested in understanding their breakdown, I was looking for variation in the process of the breakdown. So you know, when did counties kind of depart from that New Deal coalition and why? Um, And so I used um, a hierarchical clustering analysis of um, the Democratic presidential vote share in those communities from 1964 to 2016. um, And I identified different clusters of political trajectories over that time. And that was sort of kind of my, my organizing puzzle to the book which is um, these similar places. There's, you know, they were all kind of white, blue collar cities in the 1930s and 40s. They're still largely white and largely blue collar today. Um, And at one time they were part of this broader movement in American politics um, that, that, you know, part of that New Deal coalition but they broke apart at different times and probably for different reasons. And so I wanted to investigate and understand um, that sort of past process and how it's shaping contemporary politics amongst white working and middle class voters today. Okay. And you do this very interesting investigation through three towns to kind of exemplify these pieces. Um, What are the three towns and why these? (laughs) Yeah. Um, So, In the book, I uh, pseudonymize all three towns. Um, One I call Motorville. It's in Wisconsin. One I call um, Gravesend. It's in Minnesota. And one I call Lutherton, which is in Indiana. And I chose these three towns because each one is part of a different one of those clusters that I just described to you. Um, So as I mentioned before, I started that clustering analysis in 1964 because that's the year... um, when the post-civil rights racial realignment sort of broke into national politics in the U.S. And people often think of that as kind of the first break in the chain of that kind of white working class link with the Democratic Party because now, you know, white white working class voters are pulled in two directions, their racial identity with the Republican Party and their class identities and interests with the Democratic Party, right? Um, and so I started in that year um, and I found one cluster of counties um, – a very large cluster that kind of turned to the right immediately after the racial realignment starting in 1968 and sort of stayed there. You can see they really, it's not just a blip um, because, you know, uh, they, they, they voted one way in one year they really turned to the right in 1968 and they just kind of keep going to the right. And then I found another cluster that sort of stayed reasonably competitive to the Democrats up until 2016 and then turned to the right. And then Um, finally, a a much smaller cluster, just 4% of those original New Deal counties that was still voting Democratic through to 2016. And so I chose a community from within each of those clusters. Um, So the town in Wisconsin is still voting Democratic today, actually up and down the ballot. Um, The town in Minnesota was sort of a swing city up until 2016 when it had that hard turn to the right and went even further to the right in 2020. And then um, this town in Indiana, which has been Republican for decades. Um, And so I wanted to, um, I wanted to have that variation in my case selection because that kind of variation can help us understand sort of the overall pattern, right? The overall pattern, the overwhelming pattern amongst those New Deal counties was that they turned to the right. You know, the title of the book is How the Heartland Went Red. So the Heartland definitively went red during this time period, or at least the way I'm defining the Heartland as these white working class New Deal counties. Um, 96% of them turned to the right. But amongst those that turned to the right, 
they turned to the right at different times. And so I have that Gravesend case in Minnesota and the Lutherton case in Indiana to try to understand sort of variation and the timing and um, rationale for why those places turned to the right. And then I have this outlier case, one county of among just 4% of counties that's still voting Democratic that helps me understand like, why is it so difficult? Why is it so hard for these kinds of communities to for the Democrats to kind of continue um, having a stronghold in these kinds of communities. And so the phenomenon that keeps that one community in the Democratic uh, coalition helps me understand kind of, you know, why all these other communities left the Democratic coalition. This is very helpful to understand kind of as you said, the, the big trends that we're looking at, the specific questions that we zoom in even further to think about the clusters, and now we've got the towns. Yes. I think one of the key things that's um, worth highlighting at this point is that they might be different now, but they weren't, well, in some ways, I suppose they were different earlier. If we go back to the late mm-hmm. 19th or early 20th century, mm-hmm. But in a lot of ways, they do still look pretty similar at that point, mm-hmm. or maybe not. You know, if you, we go back in time, say, 100 years or so, were these towns that different then? Were those differences sure. significant? Sure. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, you know, they're not identical places, um, but they have kind of a core set of similarities that, and they've maintained a core set of similarities that allow me to rule out some sort of obvious explanations for their differences, right? So as I said, they're all overwhelmingly white and they kind of all always have been overwhelmingly white. Um, One of the communities has seen a sort of growth in immigration from uh, Mexico and Central America in the last 20 years, but that happened, uh, this is the Indiana case, happened way after they turned to the right. Um, So they have very similar sort of racial characteristics. They also have similar um, economic characteristics, like I alluded to at the beginning, Um, similar uh, kind of working class um, occupational structures. And they've all seen some degree of a transition from a kind of employment base in manufacturing to an employment base in the service sector. So those are their similarities. And if we encounter them, you know, in the ni- in 1932, sort of on the eve of that emergence of that New Deal coalition, those similarities would all have been there then and they would be there now. Um, but they had differences in 1932 and more differences have emerged over time. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the, the, um, case in Wisconsin that's still very democratic. It was uh, earlier to industrialize than the other two communities. They were slightly more agricultural, although they all were sort of small industrial cities by the 1930s. Um, And that case in Wisconsin also had a kind of really vibrant and militant labor movement um, in the late 19th century. So all three places had sort of some hint of labor activism in the 19th century. They all had Knights of Labor assemblies. Um, But then I found no evidence in the local newspaper archives of really any labor activism in my Minnesota and Indiana cases. And uh, in contrast, kind of decades of mobilization in this Wisconsin case. Um, And when I say mobilization, I mean um, violent altercations with police, um, sort of strikes at one plant that would lead to kind of citywide strikes, parades down the street, um, music, uh, socialist speakers coming to town. I mean, it was a sort of like moment in time in the 1890s and the early 1900s in this community of widespread um, like working class mobilization and working class consciousness beyond sort of the, the narrow um, – the narrow activism of the American Federation of Labor, which at that time was sort of the strongest uh, national labor organization in the country. Um, And so that was this kind of key key difference between the three places is that before the New Deal, the Wisconsin city had this really deep and strong history of militant labor mobilization, but they had also experienced a decline in the 1920s. And so the New Deal era kind of ushered in, um, I would say, labor movement revitalization in the Wisconsin town, and then sort of the beginning of labor movement activity in the Indiana and Minnesota towns.
Okay, so those are some really interesting and, as you've demonstrated, quite key differences Mm -hmm. um, in that time period. But you also mentioned the New Deal, which is a pretty important moment in this timeline. (laughs) So you talk about in the book that despite some of these differences, the New Deal era is actually pretty similar. Um, Why? Mm -hmm. So the New Deal, um, you know, obviously comes in the middle of the Great Depression. So it's a set of both material circumstances in these communities, um, skyrocketing unemployment, but also political change, um, the Wagner Act, and uh, which establishes the National Labor Relations Board and the existence of the National Labor Relations Board um, help enable labor movement mobilization across the country and particularly in industrialized communities like these three. Um, And so in my Wisconsin field site, um, you know, I came across an oral history of a labor leader who remembers like the new deal was when they all were like kind of re um, re motivated to, to start organizing again. Um, in in this Wisconsin town. Um, And then in the Indiana town, they formed a local labor council for the first time in the 1930s. And so um, local labor councils bring together unions of different shops and they talk about kind of community, civic and political engagement issues together. And it creates a sort of a sense of a a labor movement and not just individual unions, right? So these were the sort of building blocks um, of later when the AFL-CIO merged, these were the building blocks, the geographic building blocks of the national labor movement. So this Indiana town builds this labor movement for the first time. This Wisconsin town is reviving this labor movement. And then in this Minnesota town, um, they actually built this kind of citywide um, labor organization that crisscrossed um, multiple different shops, um, and it was the the Gravesend Workers Association, right? So you lived in this town, you were a worker. Um, it had shopkeepers, it had factory workers, and they were in the same sort of workers association. It wasn't affiliated with the American Federation of Labor. It wasn't affiliated with the CIO. It was just its own thing, um, and for the first time, as far as I could see in the archives, um, that organization was kind of bringing that sort of same militant labor activism I'd seen in my Wisconsin field site decades before. It was bringing that activism to this community and really uniting people throughout the town around this kind of shared mission. Um, And interestingly, in that field site, actually the National Labor Relations Board um, maybe hurt the labor movement in a way because after a prolonged labor dispute, um, the NLRB uh, granted employees in one of the largest employers the the right to unionize, but they said they had to form a union affiliated with either the AFL or the CIO, which ruled out this workers' associate, association as an option and sort of disempowered it. Um, and after – so so – Regardless, in all three of these communities, partly because of national policy, partly because of the economic conditions that kind of reinvigorated people to um, to mobilize around their jobs and their work, um, labor movements were thriving in all three places in the 1930s. But they don't stay that way, right? <laughs> and that's, that's the key thing. So yeah. if we focus on Motorville, yes. what politics were happening there that meant that it was in this place in the 30s Mm -hmm. and then has in many ways stayed there Mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that the other two which we'll get to in a moment don't what's happening in Motorville yeah so a couple things um so one is that Motorville has uh the in in the book more generally um I want to make an argument about change over time in places and in communities that is um, a response to kind of exogenous shock. So things happen to communities. Deindustrialization happens, for example, in all three of these communities. But it's also how people, community leaders and residents respond to those shocks, right? And they often respond 
um, using existing organizational resources or cultural materials, sort of the way they think they should respond, because that's how they've responded in the past. That's what I mean by cultural materials. Um, and so there's this kind of like path dependent way that people respond to shocks, but those shocks also create opportunities for change. Um, and so in this Motorville case, as in my other three, in my other two field sites, um, they did experience this kind of decline of um, industrialized employment and a shift to service sector work. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't like a total wipeout, you could say. Um, in Gravesend, Minnesota, it was it was more of a total wipeout. But um, they they were able to retain this sort of core base of um, employers. In fact, um, of the lar- the ten largest employers in the 1950s, um, most of them are still in operation today, and most of them are still union shops today. Um, so they have this kind of core stability in their economy. Um, and this, that stability creates like the bare minimum of conditions for this organized labor movement to persist, right? Like they, but then there's a choice. There's a choice to keep, um, to keep the labor movement going and to keep the labor movement involved in local politics. And you can really see that choice when you compare it to, my Indiana case, Lutherton. So there, um, they lost their largest employer in the 1970s. But when a new shop came in, a uh, new ownership came into the exact same factory and reemployed a third of the workforce, um, the same union that had represented that workforce, the UAW, failed to unionize them after two attempts. So in that case, they kept that sort of bare minimum of industrial employments, but they chose to opt out of the labor movement. And after that decision with the largest employer no longer unionized, their local labor council disbanded within a few years. um, And they just have really have had no semblance of a labor movement ever since. So in Motorville, things were different, right? It wasn't just that they had sort of the necessary preconditions for an organized labor movement. Labor leaders were routinely choosing again and again to maintain the local labor council, which is really rare these days and to retain their investment in local politics. Um, And this was particularly important uh, during the governorship of Scott Walker in Wisconsin because he really made union busting a priority with um, Act 10 and Right to Work, these two laws that sort of targeted collective bargaining rights and unionization in public and private sector workers. Um, And so when he did that, we might think, okay, well, this community is going to suffer even more. And in in some ways they did, you know, this is exactly the kind of community Scott Walker was targeting this democratic union stronghold. And, um, they did lose some, some union membership for sure, particularly because of act 10, but, um, they also, it was also a reminder like this, this reminder that they had to always remember the lesson that, their economic fortunes are rooted in politics. And if they don't work to elect people who will protect their rights as workers, then they could lose those rights. And then their material conditions will worsen, right? And so there's, and that's a, that lesson was easy for them to be, they had to be reminded of that lesson, right? They didn't have to learn it for the first time. These were, there were labor leaders still involved in the movement in the 2010s and still today who had been around during these like big battles that they'd had in the 1960s and 1970s. So it wasn't like the town had to build a movement infrastructure from the ground up in response to the Walker administration. It was that it was kind of like a kick in the seat of the pants, if, if you will. Um, and so that's that sort of like the legacy, the historical legacy of the kind of community it was and the choices that they've made over time to retain that core movement infrastructure meant that it could be revitalized in the 2010s in response to the Walker administration. Mm. All right. This is obviously a very key thing here um, about sort of continuity and in some ways kind of change over time by mm-hmm. keeping some things the same, which is an <laughs> yeah. interesting thing. Um, I'd like to kind of continue on this thread, though, of how the cities or towns, how they react to the outside, because that's such mm-hmm. a key part of explaining what's happening here. Um And one piece of this in the book that I particularly want to highlight is this comparison you do between Lutherton and Motorville, where Mm -hmm. 
they might be experiencing kind of similar problems or pressures happening internally or externally, but they seem to have very different ways of responding to them. Um, mm-hmm. Lutherton, you talk about kind of looks within itself to address the problems and kind of, you know, we're going to sort it out ourselves. Whereas mm-hmm. Motorville, to perhaps a very similar or even the same problem, goes, okay, well, how can we work with the federal government? How can we work with the state government? You know, what? how can we work not just within ourselves, but also beyond it? Mm-hmm. Why do they have these two different responses? Yeah, this is um, it's a great question. It's, it's really gets to the heart of the argument in the book about how these different local organizational contexts are shaping and sustaining residents' political beliefs and their partisanship today and kind of keeping Motorvillians in the democratic fold and sort of really reminding Luthertonians of why they're Republicans, you could say. Um, so as I've already said, you know, You have this set of politically engaged unions in Motorville. You don't have that in Lutherton. But what you do have in Lutherton is this set of really well-resourced and civically engaged churches that um, are really large and well-connected with each other and with local nonprofits. Um, And so you have this kind of collective but private problem-solving network in Lutherton and Whenever a new social problem emerges, um, and during the time of my fieldwork, these problems were usually related to hunger, homelessness, or the opioid epidemic. But as those problems emerge, people look to the churches as the people that are going to resolve those, as organizations that will resolve those challenges. Um, and when I say people, I mean residents, but also like local elected officials, even so government is also looking to churches to resolve these challenges. And then the churches step up. So they take these really visible actions to try and address things like hunger and homelessness. And they don't address hunger and homelessness. If we looked at, you know, objective indicators, those problems continue in Lutherton, but residents see them taking those actions and they don't see the federal government, as Susan Mettler and others have argued, a lot of what the federal government does to keep um, fam- middle class and um, working families going, uh, we don't see. It's invisible to us. And so they don't see the federal government addressing these things, but they do see churches and nonprofits addressing these things. And so they think, you know, when these sorts of social problems emerge, the community should resolve them with churches and nonprofits. And then they think, well, when I see other social problems like this, we should address this also with churches and nonprofits. And they start to categorize a whole set of social problems such as hunger or homelessness, as community challenges, things that can and should be resolved privately and locally. Um, And and that's their sort of reference point for thinking about um, these challenges, not just on a local scale, but also on a national scale. And in fact, people would say things like, well, you know, other places should do what we do here, or as a country, we should do more of X, Y, and Z with churches and nonprofits rather than the federal government doing these things. We do that here, and we do our churches do a really good job of it here. Um, and so this is a it's a very visible and like deeply rooted uh, experience of this uh, private but collective problem solving network. And so it's not that residents of Lutherton don't want to solve those problems. They're deeply troubled by those problems, um, just as they are in Motorville. It's just that they think they are solving them locally. Um, And so they're turning inwards to themselves to resolve them. Whereas in Motorville, as you said, People look at those same problems. Um, They look at hunger. They look at homelessness. They look at the opioid epidemic. And they view them as symptoms of this broader system of unequal economic and social conditions, right? So again and again, in Motorville, I heard from folks, like the thing that they're most worried about in the country is this really deep economic inequality. And so when they see people in their community, and they think that their community is disadvantaged in this, you know, broad system, this broadly unequal system. And so they have this systemic critique of what's going on. And when they see these other social problems, they think of them as symptoms of that broader systemic challenge. And so they look to the federal government to come in and give root cause solutions to the root cause problems, right? They want, they don't just want 
um, you know, churches to feed people who are hungry, they want good jobs, good union jobs. They want people to be paid a living wage. They can feed themselves and their families. And they think the federal government can provide some of those uh, outcomes, not just by doing things like supporting unions, but also by redistributing from the 1% who seem to be the only people in the country who are doing okay. So that's a really helpful kind of differentiation to the same sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. Um, So thank you for taking us through that. And I'd like to kind of add a layer to what you've just told us about, because especially this idea of people seeing things and Mm -hmm. then linking them together and linking them at different scales is so key to this. Mm -hmm. Can we link it then to political parties, specifically in partisanship? Mm -hmm. How does kind of what you're telling us as you say in the book, both produce and reproduce partisanship. Yeah. So um, I argue in the book that these local organizational contexts help reproduce two cultural frameworks, I call them. But basically it's it's ways of um, thinking about yourself, your community, and where you fit into party politics, right? So the first cultural framework, um, it's a diagnostic frame for identifying uh, social problems and appropriate political solutions. That's what I was just talking about, right? These living in a community with well-resourced churches that solve social problems or living in a community with politically engaged unions that remind you that economic outcomes are linked to political outcomes, those organizations... Um, and observing the way those organizations work with local government to solve problems reminds people like, okay, when I see this kind of social problem, when I see hunger, it's a case of X or it's a case of Y. In Motorville, hunger is a case of this broader issue of uh, inequality. It's something politics can fix, something the federal government can fix. In Lutherton, hunger is a case of a community challenge, something that we can fix privately locally with churches and nonprofits. Um, And then the other thing that local organizations do is they shape narratives of community identity, I call it. And these are the stories people tell themselves kind of about, you know, who their community are, who they are, and then where they fit into national party politics. Um, And so in Lutherton, it's not just that these churches are well-resourced and solving social problems. It's that um, they are uh, sort of the the church ecology in this community is dominated by these very large, prominent and old um, German Lutheran churches, as people call them. Uh, and so, if you go to this town, I, within a few hours of my first ever stepping foot in there, multiple people had told me that this was a German Lutheran community. Um, And that's despite the fact that, as I said, they have experienced immigration from Mexico and Central America in recent years. The town is changing, but it just doesn't feel that way to a lot of the white native-born residents who I interviewed because it's still this kind of German Lutheran community. It's a very Christian community, right? And so it's a way of expressing this sort of ethno-religious identity, um, living in a community where everyone is expected to be attending a church um, where uh, these like ethnic German roots are really strong. It's on street signs. They have festivals. Um, When you enter the town from any direction, you will see a sign advertising the five largest uh, churches in the county, uh, German Lutheran churches in the county. And so this is a place where people think of, where people are kind of routinely reminded among the many identities that could be salient to them. They're routinely reminded of their white Christian identities right? And that's local organizations and the way people talk about local organizations and the narratives that people tell about their community because of those local organizations are leading people to coalesce around this understanding of like, we are this white Christian community and the Republican party. And so then they see party politics as really divided along these lines of race and religion, and also the extent to which the federal government is going to intervene in these kinds of communities. And so they see the Republican party as the party of Christian morality, representing people like them and their community. Um, And that message really resonates with them. And so part of this argument about 
uh, narratives of community identity is that it, it it shapes not only the way we understand ourselves, but the way we view party politics because it shapes the messages from the parties that resonate most with us and our self-image and our community image. Um, and, you know, that's really important because the parties today represent these bundles of different issues, bundles of different social groups. And so it's not right or wrong to look at the Republicans and say they're the party of Christian morality. Someone else can say, well, no, they're the party of, um, you know, gun, gun, guns, you know, and everyone should be able to have a gun. Both of those things are right. But in this particular community, because of the local organizations, they see their own sort of set of concerns reflected in the parties. And that's what resonates most with them. And so that sort of reinforces their Republican Party identification um, over time. And similarly, in Motorville and Wisconsin, um, those folks who are so deeply concerned about these economic inequalities, they think of themselves as living in this disadvantaged community. Um, And it really reminds them that sort of they are part of a broad group of people who are struggling in this unequal economic system. So they see themselves more as in alliance with other people occupying similar class positions, although folks really rarely use this kind of class-based language. That's what they're talking about, right? They're talking about sharing something in common with other people who occupy that similar location in this unequal economic system. And they view the Democrats as the party to bring in the federal government and support unions and kind of help people like them. They think of themselves as the kinds of people who would benefit from redistributive policies and the Democrats as the party to provide that. And so it's not that they're like unaware that abortion is a major issue and Democrats and Republicans have different stances on abortion. They're certainly aware of that. But for them, the most salient division in party politics, living in this highly um, politically engaged unionized community, the most salient division is this class division. And that guides them towards the Democratic Party. All right. So let's complicate this because, of course, we don't already have a whole bunch of things running around in our conversation. (laughs) What about Gravesend? How does, for example, not just Democrat and Republican, but specifically Donald Trump speak Mm. to Gravesend? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, And actually, something you said earlier, I think, really resonates with the differences between Motorville and Lutherton on the one hand and Gravesend on the other. It's sort of in Motorville and Lutherton, in some ways we can see how stability produces change or stability produces divergence. There's There are certainly changes in those communities over time, but a lot of the story in the book in those places about is about reproduction over time, um, reproduction of the local organizational context that help reproduce partisan attachments and on the one hand, you know, helps keep Lutherans Republic Luthertonians Republican, but it, it, you know, somewhat most surprisingly keeps this town in Motorville in the Democratic column. And so that's this story of reproduction. But the story of Gravesend is a story where things don't reproduce. They sort of break down. Um and that's because um they sort of lost their largest employer in the 1990s. Um, But that employer had been sort of shedding employees for several years prior to that. Um, And so they still have a very uh, quite sizable private and public sector unions in this community. And they still have um, plenty of churches and they actually have a higher rate of church attendance than Lutherton. But in this community, partly because of the loss of this employer and the loss of population that came after that, those organizations, those unions and churches, they're no longer doing what they once did. So they, the churches, although they have members, they don't have the same high quality of membership that Lutherton's churches have. So they aren't able to do the same sort of highly visible problem solving that Lutherton's churches do. And the unions, well, the unions haven't even prior to the decline of the largest employer, the unions haven't been engaged in local politics for decades, as far as I can tell. Um, and so that means that the unions, while they um, 
might be very effective at collective bargaining and kind of maintaining good healthcare provisions for their workers, which is all very important, of course, they're not doing the same kind of political activism that they're doing in Motorville. And so it's not having the same sort of political consequences as it is in Motorville. Um, and they, they no longer have that local labor council that, that Motorville has. They don't really have what I was talking about before, which is like an actual labor movement. They just have unions. Um, so they have unions and they have churches, but they don't have these organizations that are doing the same things that we're seeing. And that's changed over time. And so you add all of this up together, this sort of really salient and impactful material loss when the employer left. left. And then the fact that local organizations aren't stepping into that void or aren't able to step into that void and say, here's how to diagnose this problem. Here's how to think about this as a political issue. Here's the kind of community we are. And here's the party that will will help us um, fix these problems. When local organizations aren't doing that, people are just sort of left with that sense of loss and this feeling of a void. And they don't, and they, they're sort of without um, coherent leadership as to how to resolve those challenges. And, um, you know, if you, if you step into this town, the same way as in Lutherton, people will, will immediately start telling you it's a, a German Lutheran community in this town. They'll immediately start telling you it's a dying community. Um, and so they feel threatened. Um, and the Republican party in particularly, uh, not just Donald Trump, but you know the Republican congressional representative for this district also were at the time doing a really good job of articulating a message that resonated with that local experience of loss and threat and this sort of threat of extinction, right? The threat of death. Um, and that message was that immigration and socialism were this sort of additional dual threat to this kind of white small town way of life, right? That And that the Democratic Party was supporting immigration um, and they were supporting immigration for their own electoral ends, but also they were supporting it by providing immigrants with social services that people in this community would never have access to. And so the federal government becomes this um, entwined with this threat to this way of life. So it's no longer a possibility for, of no longer offers the possibility of helping this community through redistribution. Like I was saying in Wisconsin, it becomes this really malignant force. Hmm. Really interesting to think about how two very different kinds of community structures in the other two um, can still kind of lead in some cases to different politics than Mm -hmm. somewhere that's like almost caught in the middle. And that, that, that's where it, (laughs) goes from there. So thank you for adding Gravesend into our um, discussion. (laughs) Speaking, I suppose, about Motorville again, because in a lot of ways, it's kind of the one that has changed the least, I suppose. You know, Mm. if we go right back to the beginning of the conversation or the New Deal when they were all sort of similar, the other two have changed in a bunch of ways. But Motorville, at least to my reading, was kind of the one that looked in some ways the most similar in terms of community structures and political Mm -hmm. analysis of politics. Is this uniqueness something Motorville can sustain? Oh, that's, I think, the big question. And um, I'm kind of ambivalent about it, right? So like I said at the beginning, one of the reasons that I wanted to study a, an outlier case like Motorville is to understand, like, why is it an outlier? Why did the heartland go red? What's going on here that's not going on in these other places? And the answer, as already said, is these politically engaged, uh, is politically engaged labor movement. But, um, and the reason that, you know, these other communities don't have that is it's really hard to have that. It's really hard to have that in the 21st century in particular because of these material economic changes that we've experienced with deindustrialization, but also because of public policies, things like what I referred to as Scott Walker in Wisconsin, which have made it even ever more difficult for um, workers to organize. And so you put all that together and you can see why Motorville is an outlier. Um, And in the book, actually, sometimes I refer to it as an anachronism. So to your point, it is this place that it feels sometimes like I'm talking to you about a community that um, existed 
during the New Deal, right? Like it feels out of place in this era. Um, And that's because it's so rare to have these kinds of local organizations doing these things. And so that should also make us afraid that um, for the future of a place like this, like it's been able to be this kind of unicorn um, community organizationally and politically, and can it stay that way? Um, So during my fieldwork, right at the end of my time there, uh, in the fall of 2021, I went back, or summer of 2021, excuse me, I went back to Motorville and kind of presented my findings to the local labor council. And when I was there, you know, things weren't looking great. Um, There was some discussion over increasing um, the dues and some of the unions couldn't really understand why that was justified. One of the larger private sector unions in the community had left the local labor council because they were actually very politically active on their own and they felt they didn't need the to pay dues to the local labor council. Um, and so it's a kind of tenuous it's a, it's in a tenuous and precarious position, but in the same way that uh, politics have made it harder for workers to organize and for the labor movement to be a movement, politics can make it easier. And so um, in that respect, I think that, uh, you know, Joe Biden's presidency has been um, great for the labor movement. And so I think that if there's one takeaway from this book in terms of like what makes Motorville, Motorville and how does Motorville stay Motorville? It's that the politics um, of unionization, the, the policies supporting unionization and supporting workers' rights to org- to organize and mobilize are really important. Okay, so that's a very helpful takeaway. Um, but I wonder if I can push you to ask for another yeah. takeaway um, about the book, because uh, I think another big point of it is worth highlighting as we come to the end of our discussion. Sure. Um, that place matters, right? We may not think that. We've got the internet. You know, we all watch the same TV. Things are a lot less local than they perhaps were when these towns were all in the New Deal. But the subtitle of your book is Why Local Forces Matter. So how and why do you think place will continue to be important in American politics? This is a great question. So, um, You know, in the book, I make the argument in the last couple of chapters that um, place is likely to continue to matter because some of these forces that we think of as kind of nationalizing politics and drawing us out of our communities, the internet, um, more specifically social media, cable news, whatever those forces might be, um, those forces aren't actually destabilizing the things I'm talking about in this book, the local organizations, right? So the local organizations are what's driving the dynamics I'm talking about, the place-based dynamics I'm talking about. And, you know, social media isn't, isn't eradicating churches. It's not affecting unions. Um, public policy is, as I just said. Um, and so in some ways, those things, those things, uh, of course, matter, and they. But I, I think that often what they do is kind of temporarily take us out of our lived experience and the things that matter to us, right? Like we might see on the news that Joe Biden has said something that we really disagree with, and you know it it makes us even angrier at the Democrats, and it pushes us even further toward the Republicans, but likely in a couple of weeks, we won't necessarily be thinking about that thing that Joe Biden said. It was a sort of temporary reaction or it temporarily shifted my policy. If I'm a Republican, I Joe Biden said this and I thought, oh, if Joe Biden thinks that, I think the opposite. And so I developed an opinion in the moment in time. And that's often what we think about when we think about nationalizing politics. I, what Joe Biden says, I agree with my Democrat or I disagree with my Republican. But those things, they come and they go. And a lot of what sustains our politics is our lived experience, whether that's structured by place or otherwise. Um, But the things that like where we live, where we work, who we talk to, how we were raised, those things are really durable. They inform our partisan attachments in the first place. And um, I think that um, it's a mistake to um, forget about them. (laughs) 
See, another good takeaway. I knew there was one. So thank you for letting me ask you about it. Yeah. I do have one final question, though, but I promise it's not about a takeaway. Um, You've given us two good ones for this book. And so I wonder if as a final question, I can ask you that now that this book is out in the world, is there anything you might be looking at next, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on this exact topic that you'd like to give us a sneak preview of? (laughs) Yes. Well, I love the way you said out in this world. That's how I think about, I'm like, the book is out in the world. You can hold it. Um, It's very exciting. But yes, I am working on a new book project, actually. Um, Right before I got on this call, I just finished drafting chapter three. Um, But It is a book about um, suburban politics, particularly suburban liberalism um, and the limits to suburban liberalism when it comes to local issues such as housing and education. And so in a lot of ways, I think of this book as exactly the same as my first book. I'm still really interested in place and the way place shapes um, people's political behavior and their identities. But in this case, I'm going the sort of opposite context. So no longer white post-industrial cities, but now affluent coastal suburbs. And I'm more interested in how those contexts are shaping local political dynamics around housing and education rather than national partisan attachments. Okay, well, I'm excited that there's another book. Um, (laughs) And it sounds cool for what it actually is. So when it is out in the world that time, uh, please come back (laughs) and you can tell us more about it. Um, But of course, in the meantime, listeners can read the one we've been talking about that is currently out in the world titled How the Heartland Went Red, Why Local Forces Matter in an Age of Nationalized Politics, published by Princeton University Press. Stephanie, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you again for having me. Thank you.